I know a lot's been going on in life. I know with every one of us, it could be health, it could be finances, it could be you name it. Uh, maybe you're purchasing a house. Maybe you're trying to sell a house. Maybe um, the car is making noises that you've never heard before. Maybe your car is making noises no one's ever heard before. But, but all these things happen in life, and what it does is it builds anxiety. In all of these things, we can, we can start to get worried. We can start to build, build anxiety. Anxiety has risen 25% since the coronavirus was introduced into our country. You go across the board, all across the country, anxiety has gone up about 25% among adults. More depression and anxiety medication are being purchased or prescribed than ever before in the history of the country. Mental disorders are a leading diagnosis within the realm of the symptom of anxiety. So now you have anxiety and now it's been documented as a mental disorder. So it's amazing how this topic has taken over. Anxiety is, is uh, it's like a blanket that's been thrown over the entire country. And anxiety, if you say, if you say the word anxiety, a lot of people are like, yeah, I, I suffer with that. Well, so do I. When you pull out in front of me while I'm driving, suddenly I'm experiencing anxiety. I'm not going to pop a pill for it, but I, I, I might honk. But, but something, something's happening there, and it's called anxiety. It's interesting that all of this is happening in our country all at once. All these people have anxiety. With all this information, I have one question. What is it that's causing anxiety today more than times past? What's going on? Because everybody's got it now. What's causing the anxiety today more than times past? It is interesting that the people living now have a greater level of apprehension than those who came before us. We are an anxious group of people. We are an anxious generation. I want you to know that I'm not putting anyone down for having anxiety. I'm also not saying that anxiety is not a real thing because it is a real thing. And some people really do battle with this. It is a real thing. This is just a really good question to ask. Why now? People aren't created differently today than they were created before. We're, we're created the same way. Why are we experiencing anxiety on the level that we're experiencing it in the generations before us? They came up with phrases like rub some dirt on it, which is not a good medical piece of medical advice. But that, that's what they would say. You know, you come in and say, okay, I'm really struggling. And they say, rub some dirt on it. And by the way, pick that up and follow me. You know, that, that, was, that was how they handled things. But we don't handle things the same way these days. Something has thrown us off. And I think it would be wise to ask ourselves why. What's going on? And why are we dealing with this as a generation? I want to show you a verse that applied to every generation before ours. And it has applied to our generation also. By the way, the word of God applies to you, it applies to me, it applies to your great, 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 great grandpa and your great, 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 great grandchild. The, the word of God stands true, it's the living word of God and it applies to all of us throughout all of time. Philippians chapter four and verse six. This is what God told us. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. <clears throat> now, did God just not know that this generation was coming? Or have we created a problem that should have never existed? Personally, I want to go with door number two on this one. God knew that this generation was coming. He saw that. He knew what we were going to deal with. When he recorded this, had this scripture recorded, he knew we were going to be around too. He understood that. Actually, he had recorded it in a much more difficult time than we're dealing with right now. When, the, when this verse was given, it was a, they were struggling with a few things. The first century Christians were captured and sent into the arena where they were mauled to death by wild animals. I'm going to say that might produce anxiety. I don't know about you, but that's just not how I want to spend the afternoon. I, I'm thinking that might produce some anxiety. They were hung on stakes and set on fire. They had their children tortured in front of them while they were waiting their own death. That's what the first century church had to endure. Philippians 4.6 was given in that generation. 
That's the generation. If any generation had the right to be anxious, I'm going to say they won. It's yours. Go ahead and panic. It fits your generation. If any generation had the right to be anxious, I would say that one would be the winner. Yet this was the generation who received the letter telling them to be anxious for nothing. And then you fast forward to 2023 and look what we've become. Look at our generation. Somewhere along the line, we have forsaken a very important ingredient to how to live. We, we've forsaken this. Anxiety is a real thing. I'm not downplaying that. That is a real thing. And some people deal with this on a greater level than other people. But why has it gotten to the point where it's crippling our nation? Anxiety is a word that, I mean, pull up Facebook today and just scroll for a little bit. Chances are you'll see some post about anxiety. It's, it'll be there. I want to look at a story that took place during the time that Jesus was on the earth. Jesus just got done preaching and ministering to the multitudes, and he and the disciples get in a boat, and they're going to cross the Sea of Galilee. They had been traveling for some time when anxiety begins to build quickly. Um, and by the way, it is a situation where anxiety would rise. Look at Mark chapter 4 and verse 37. It says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. Okay, so this, is, this isn't just a scary storm that's going on around these people. The storm was in the boat. Th that gets close to home right there. The storm is in the boat. The boat was filling with water, and the waves are continuing to slam into the boat and filling it up more with water. So this would be a situation that would cause anxiety no matter what generation you're part of. Go out into an ocean and let it fill your boat and see, see how you handle that. Anxiety is going to kick in. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what generation you're part of. Anxiety is going to hit in a situation like this. The disciples thought they were going to die, and they are in full panic mode. They don't have time to think about anything else. They are in full panic mode, full throttle. What should we do, guys? How about freak out? Okay, I'm ready for that. I am fully prepared. Let's freak out. That's the mode they're in. Now, we're going to leave those guys right there for a, mo a moment because it'll be fun. We're just going to leave them right there because I want to I want to focus on something else that's often ignored. I want to leave those guys in that boat panicking and let's let's look at something else here. Jesus didn't just speak to people and say great things. Sometimes we think, well, Jesus was wise, and he, and he preached, and that's what Jesus did, and he just said great things to people. That's not all he did. He ministered to people, and that is a lot of work. Saying something kind or something wise, that, you just say it. But he was ministering to people, and that is exhausting. What Jesus was doing was pouring himself into the life of other people. He invested in other people. We often, forget, uh, we, offer, uh, we often consider the fact that Jesus was 100% God, but we forget that he was also 100% human. He's, he was 100% human. And to show you how much he exhausted himself through the act of ministering to people, take a look at this next verse. Verse 38. But when he, he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now consider the scene one more time. The boat is filling up with water. Waves are continuing to slam into the boat and adding more water to the situation. The wind is tossing the boat around everywhere, and Jesus is out. He is sleeping. That's a high level of exhaustion right there. I've slept through storms before, but I have, a, I have this slight feeling that if a wave were to hit me, I might have woken up. Jesus is exhausted. It didn't matter what was happening around him. He was so tired. He's exhausted. He's sleeping during this storm. Jesus invested himself into people at a level that we don't commonly see. We don't see somebody pour their life into another individual like Jesus did for people. We think about the sacrifice of his death, but what about the sacrifice in the way he lived his life? We don't think about that that often. But he was pouring his life into people. Jesus set the example, but we, typically con we don't typically consider what that looked like. We just, yeah, we, he died and we appreciate that. Well, how, what about his life? He was exhausted because he invested into every person. He loved them. 
After a whole day of investing into the lives of other people, Jesus needed some sleep. He was drained. And just by that scenario right there, you're like, yeah, I'm guessing he was pretty tired. Yeah, the waves are hitting him. Of course they're hitting him. The boat's being tossed around. He's just out. He is just sleeping. I'm sure he fell asleep before the storm hit, but he remained that way while the storm was going on. The disciples wake him up, and they immediately ask him an accusatory question. That's the first thing they do. Do you not care that we are perishing? Now, here's, here's just a fun fact here. Were they perishing? No. Were, are you dying? No, I'm getting wet. I'm getting very, very wet. Is that what you call perishing? No, no, I'm dying. They have taken the level of what's going on right now. We're getting wet. We're being thrown around. We're having a hard time keeping our balance here. And what is the description of that? Perishing. We, we are dying. We are dying. So in their minds, they have now taken, they've escalated this situation to the worst case scenario. This is what anxiety can do. It, it takes it up a notch. Oh, don't worry about this. What if this happens? Oh my goodness, that's even worse. And if that happens, this is going to happen. Full panic mode. Well, now we're freaking out about something that's not happening, but in our mind, it is happening. It is definitely happening. We are dying. No, you're just hungry. I'm starving. Ask a teenager. What's the matter? I'm starving. Do you know what starving means? My, my son is starving on a regular basis. We don't feed him. We just don't feed our children. We must not because they're always starving. All teenagers are starving. But if you think about that, isn't that kind of an escalated version of what's going on? No, that noise was your stomach. That is not starvation. That is just hunger. And we, we can take care of it. Eat a banana. I don't want a banana. Then you're not starving. <laughs> Talk to a starving individual. You say, you want a banana? Yes, please. It doesn't matter what you offer them. Starving is not the level you're at. These disciples are going through the same thing. We are perishing. We are dying. So there's no doubt in my mind that Jesus is a little bit groggy when they wake him up and say, we're dying. We're di Do you not care that we are dying? Like you're soaked. Nigh unto death soaked. We are, we are dying. Like, okay. I'm sure he's a little bit groggy. He's been woken up. And when he sees the storm, he handles it much the same way that we do when our, we're woken up by our kids when we're exhausted. Look at verse 39. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Let me rephrase that. Be quiet. I'm trying to sleep. I'm exhausted. Peace, that means be quiet, and be still is actually translated, if you, if you look at the word, it means muzzle it. Put a muzzle on it. Shut up and muzzle it. I'm really tired right now. I'm tired. And then the sea calms down. It just stops. He's talking directly to the storm. The disciples say, we've got a problem, we're dying. And Jesus looks at the storm and says, hey, quiet, muzzle it. And the storm stops. He's telling the storm to go away. He's tired, he needs some rest. Now, try to take the scene in. Jesus wakes up and he tells the storm to stop. And it does. Put yourself in the shoes of the disciples right here. Like, don't you care that we're dying? Quiet. Now, what do you say as a disciple? Uh, are you okay? Are you still dying? Uh, are you still dying? No, I'm feeling better. Okay. What are you going to say? <laughs> what are you going to say in this scenario? I am no longer perishing, thank you. Um, are you healthier now than you were before? No. So you weren't perishing? It doesn't look like it. What are you, you going to say? It's an awkward situation. So Jesus tells the storm to stop. It stops. At that moment, the disciples' jaws most likely hit the, the boat. They're just, oh my goodness. One moment, they are in panic mode. The next moment, they're on a peaceful boat ride staring at Jesus in complete awe. <laughs> that changed quickly. Like, go ahead, say what you're going to say. I've got nothing. I've got nothing. Death was the only outcome they could see a moment ago, but it was assumed that they were perishing. They weren't perishing. They just assumed they were. Now they say things differently. 
And then Jesus asks them a question. Now he's done talking to the storm. And he looks at the disciples and he asks them a question. Look at verse 40. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You can almost see Jesus saying this as he lays his head back down on his pillow. <laughs> like, why are you so fearful? Is it that you, you have no faith? As he's laying his head back down, I'm tired, guys. I'm very tired. Why is worry the leading emotion? Why, why are, you there? are you there? Why is worry the leading emotion? I think we all understand why anxiety was present. I think we all get it. The boat was their security and it was filling up with water. That's why they were anxious. Every one of us would be too. Jesus understood that too. He, he knew why anxiety was there. He wasn't asking a stupid question. Why are you fearful? Uh, big storm? Jesus knew the answer to that. Why is there anxiety? He knows the answer to that. The storm caused the fear. But Jesus didn't just ask them why they were afraid. He asked them why they were full of fear. Why are you fearful? Why, why are you full of fear? They had no room or at least very little room for faith. Fear had been allowed to take over. You are completely full of fear. What else you got in there? Nothing. Full panic, full anxiety. That's all I am right now. Why did you fill up with that? Why, why is that all you have room for right now? Why are you fearful? We know this because of the next question. How is it that you have no faith? Where's the room for the faith? Where, where's that at? You are so preoccupied with fear that there's no room for anything else. You're paralyzed by anxiety and you cannot figure out how to function now because you're so full of anxiety and fear. You don't know how to move forward. When Jesus asked them this question, they freak out again. This is, this is I love this. They're gonna freak out again. He says, why are you so fearful? Have you no faith? And they freak out again, but this time it's a different kind of fear. Look at verse 41. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? The word fearful that Jesus used the first time was a picture of dread, a full anxiety, dread. This is the kind of fear that shuts people down. And you deal with, you talk to people that who, who do deal with anxiety, and it's a real thing in their life, they deal with anxiety, it shuts you down. It's hard to think about anything else, it's hard to focus on anything else, it's hard to accomplish anything because you're focused on the storm. That's all you see is the storm. Like, hey, look at all the good things that are happening. Yeah, they're going to blow away because look at the storm. Yeah, but look at all the blessings, right? We got to deal with the storm. I'm, I can only focus on the storm. Jesus is saying, why are you so full of this anxiety? Why are you so fearful? But in verse 41, a different kind of fear is being mentioned. This is a fear that was caused by the calm, not by the storm. This is a different kind of fear. This is the kind of thing that should take us back. This is the kind of thing, the calm should be what takes us by surprise, not the storm. When Jesus says, peace be still, and it's all still, that should shock us. That should take us by surprise. The storm should never take us by surprise. We build up fear of the storm all the time. But why do we do that? Death, health, finances, these are all storms. They're all things that bring anxiety. Every generation has had to face these things. Every person who has walked to this earth before you has had to deal with the same kind of things. So why are we taken by surprise when the storm blows in? Why does that shock us? Shouldn't we know by now that that's just part of life? Grandpa, great-grandpa, grandma, great-grandma, they all dealt with this too. Are they, did, did they make it? Are they, did they, did it end them? No. We got hit by a car, that's what ended them. Okay, but the finances didn't do it? No. So all these things that we worry about our whole life, all those things that are just stacked up, why are we stopped there? Why can't we live past those? Every generation before us has had to deal with these same things. But it gets worse. 
We don't only fear when the storm blows in. We fear when we think it might. It's not just when the storm blows in. We fear when we think it might blow in. And that's what makes it so we don't do anything but worry. In contrast, the fear that cal the calm brings in is a sense of awe and wonder. That's that fear. I, I am completely taken back by the calm. That's what should take us by surprise. Why is God still good when I do the things I do? That's a calming fear. That's a good thing. The disciples were in awe and wonder because of who Jesus was. The winds and the seas obey this guy, and he chose to be our friend. That's amazing. That's amazing. He was never going to leave them. He was never going to forsake them. And that was awesome. I want to show you another place where this kind of fear occurred. And many of you know the story. Four men decide to bring their friend, their paralyzed friend, to Jesus to see if he could help or if he, he could heal their friend. The crowd around Jesus was too big for them to get near Jesus, so they chose to tear the roof away and lower him down to where Jesus was. We can't get through the crowd, so hey, here's an idea. Let's destroy the place. Let's go up on the roof and let's tear it away and let's, let's lower him down to be in front of Jesus so we can get to Jesus. Jesus was so impressed by the faith of these man's, this man's friends that he elected to use this moment to reveal himself again as the Messiah. Watch what he does and notice where the fear takes place. Mark chapter 2 and verse 11. I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he, he arose, took up the bed, and went out of the presence of them all. So that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. That statement, all were amazed, is where that calm causing fear happens. They're, sh they're totally amazed. They're shocked. Jesus just told a man who was paralyzed to take up his bed and walk. And when he did it, the crowd stood in amazement or fear. That's that same kind of fear. Who is this that the ailments of this man's legs obey? They're in the same situation. Who is this man who can do these things? Who is this? I'm sure this was a moment nobody there was ever going to forget. But let's take this whole scenario in a hypothetical direction just for a second. Let's have a little bit of fun here. What if this man had allowed anxiety to take over at that moment? When Jesus says, arise and take up your bed, what if he just laid there and started voicing his concerns? What if it hurts? What if, what if I fall? What if some version of a storm comes in and I just don't have the strength to get through it? What if anxiety came in and he started asking those questions instead? Well, if the story would have unfolded like this, I think there might have been a follow-up verse that went something like this. You will never fall because you don't have the faith to stand. Don't worry about falling because you're not going to be standing. Your anxiety is going to keep you there because you're not moving forward because anxiety has crippled you. Not just the disease, not just the ailment that's crippled you, now you're crippled by anxiety. The reason why you won't fall is because you won't stand. But I would, you could stand, you could stand. I know that I, what I'm about to say can be very controversial, but I do believe it needs to be said. Anxiety is not a mental disorder. A lot of times we hear it is, but anxiety is not a mental disorder. It's the natural part of the human condition. It is not a disease. Anxiety is a thought process. That's what anxiety is. It is a thought process. It can eventually pour over into physical traits. You can get ulcers and all sorts of fun stuff. If you, if you live with anxiety and you make it a big part of your life, it can pour over into physical traits, but it is not a physical thing. It is a thought process, and it is a normal thought process. Those people that go out there to those thrill, thrill seekers, 
that jump out of the plane and try to put their parachute on the way down, that's anxiety. That's what they're feel feeling. That sense of thrill, that is anxiety. It's a natural thing. We all experience this in life. Three million cases of anxiety disorders are diagnosed each year. Try to comprehend that. Three million cases every year. We have brand new mental disorders coming out of the woodwork all the time. Now we all need medication. Everyone's scared. Everyone's got anxiety. There are actually, this, this blew my mind. There are actually anxiety screenings being done to people without symptoms to help you understand whether or not you may have early signs of anxiety disorder. That's cool. Are you freaked out? No. Let's talk. <laughs> and by the time you leave, you're like, I'm a little freaked out. And they can prescribe you medicine for that. No big deal. It's amazing what's going on in our culture right now based on the topic of anxiety. Please don't get me wrong. Mental illnesses do exist. I'm not, I'm not downplaying anything here. I'm not downplaying anxiety. I'm not downplaying mental illnesses. It does happen. It's just not as wide of a problem as we're being told. Some people may even need to get some help for what they're going through. That's true. But it's not as big of a problem as we're being told it is. But when what is happening in life is undesirable... Let's say you're a little freaked out because the finances or because the, the noise that that car is making or your health or whatever. When life is undesirable, it doesn't mean that there's a medical problem. That's not what that means. It may just mean that life is difficult right now. <clears throat> that may be all it is. Life is just difficult right now. It may not even be a problem at all. It just may not be what you planned. It's just that simple. Things aren't going your way. Social media is a large proponent of anxiety today. Everybody's got it, and everyone else is worried about getting it. It's just, it's out there. We worry about the way other people think about us. It's as if we have to be liked by everyone in order for them to love us. It's, it's amazing what's happening with even social media. We focus on everything and everyone around us when God says to do this right here. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men. Why do we worry so much about how others see us when it's the way God sees us that matters the most? Why, why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we do this to ourselves? We live in a culture that throws the word anxiety around like it's our nationality. It's crazy. It's crazy what's going on right now. We're stuck in a pattern that we have created ourselves. Are things going to go wrong in life? Yes. By the way, you don't have to figure this out. Yes. Things are going to go wrong in life. Are health problems going to happen? Yes. Will we eventually die? Yes. Yes. In the meantime, live. Live. Just live. This is just life, and life is not a sickness. It's just life. We are a culture who is easily paralyzed by the hypothetical, and that's amazing to me. We are easily paralyzed by the hypothetical. We don't try things for the fear that we might fail. Well, let me put this on your refrigerator, put it on your forehead, wherever you need to put it, just to try to remember. Put it on somebody else's forehead. You won't see it that often if you put it on your own forehead. So write it on the person next to you. But I want you to remember this. The only people who never fail are the ones who never try. Why are you not doing anything? Because I'm afraid. What, what if it goes wrong? Well, you're not going to fail because you're not going to try. The only people who never fail are the ones who never try. Can we do something great for God? Not if we don't get up off that bed and walk. You're just going to stay there if you don't get up and do something. Our culture is trying to groom us for anxiety. The more anxiety, the more medication, the more medication, the more anxiety. And it's a fun little game we're doing here. It's time to rethink and renew our minds. Remember, it is a thought process. So we need to renew our minds. We need to rethink this. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 
says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I also want to remind you about something that God gave you as a gift. It almost seems like we're hardwired to fear anymore. We're, we're taught to fear. But what would happen if we just let go and let God? What would happen? Well, life would happen. We would start living instead of just being alive. Life would start happening. Bad things would happen. But good things will also happen. We may get hurt, but we also may rise up, take our bread, and walk. That could happen too. All of this is part of life. Look at the gift I was talking about here in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. What happens if it all crashes and burns? What happens if it crashes and burns? Well, I guess we'll find out when and if that happens. But right now, it's not crashing, it's not burning. We'll find out if and when that happens. But let's not waste our time trying to solve a problem that we have no expertise to solve. The problem's not there yet, the solution doesn't need to be there yet. Jesus told us not to borrow trouble from tomorrow. Tomorrow's got its own problems. You, isn't today full enough? We don't need to borrow trouble from tomorrow. The hypothetical, we don't need to do that. Just understand that we have a God who already has tomorrow under control. Go ahead. Understand that. Grab a pillow and get some sleep. You may need it if the boat does crash. Go ahead and grab a pillow and sleep. But Jesus is in that boat with you. He's in that boat with you all the way. Anxiety needs to be attacked with faith. God is with you. Live right there. Live there. God is with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. Live right there. But if you truly want a prescription for anxiety, here it is. Everybody's going to leave with a prescription. And by the way, I am licensed to give this one. <laughs> Let's look at that first verse again. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. When you are praying with thanksgiving, you are placing your confidence in God rather than in the storm. A thankful heart is full of thanks, which means there is no vacancy for fear. There's no vacancy. Uh, is there any room for me? Nope. My heart is so full of thanksgiving right now. I'm not worried about anything. I'm just thankful that God has taken care of me. If you deal with anxiety, you should speak to someone to help you discover what's, what storm is causing that. Please take care of that because it is a real thing. People do deal with this. But talk to somebody and try to figure out what storm is causing that anxiety. But in the meantime, trust in God. He's got you. He, he's got you. Trust that the storm serves a purpose. And God is in control of that storm. Grab a pillow and rest in him. The storm will stop when it's over.